Hi everyone, good morning. Um, thank you for coming to this set of faculty talks today, or, or thank you for coming to Jackie's talk today. <laughs> um, my name is Irina Chen, and I'm a junior at Wellesley College, and I'm majoring in biological sciences. I'm also a student researcher in Professor Jackie Mathesee's Ecolab. This semester, I'm also taking her course on advanced topics in ecology. Professor Matthews is an assistant professor in Wellesley College and, she, and, Wellesley College and the Biological Sciences Department. Um, she got her undergrad at Harvard University and received her PhD degree at Berkeley. In addition to teaching a course on advanced topics in ecology this semester, Jackie will also be teaching intro to organismal biology and biological modeling in the spring. In general, Professor Matthews' research focuses on the changes and resilience of ecosystems to disturbance. This semester, the Matthews Eco Lab is looking at the interactions between climate and forest insects and pathogens. We are also happy to note that this is funded by both the NSF and the Paulson Initiative. Professor Matthews' other research also includes looking at the impact of climate change on wetlands and studying the long-term changes in forests over centuries. So without further ado, please help me welcome Professor Jackie Matthews, and I hope you all enjoy the talk today. Hi, good morning everyone. It's a pleasure to be here today to get a chance to share with you all um, some of my research and some of my teaching, uh, because that's something that I really value in being at Wellesley, the chance to really combine the two. Um, so I hope you, you see that um, in the talk and kind of take that as the message. Wellesley students get a chance to do cutting edge research and they're also learning these research methods in the classroom as well. So my talk focuses on climate change, and climate change is happening because carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere are rising. This is a figure showing um, from 1960 through present, this rise in carbon dioxide. And so this is happening because we're burning fossil fuels. So when we extract oil and gas from the ground from our deep geologic deposits and burn them, they're releasing carbon dioxide to the atmosphere. And then once that carbon dioxide is in the atmosphere, it stays there for a long time. It stays there on the order of five to 200 years once we release carbon dioxide to the atmosphere. And so that's why climate change is really a global problem. The carbon dioxide levels are accumulating and mixing everywhere around our planet because the lifetime of carbon dioxide is so long in the atmosphere. And so we've known that carbon dioxide warms the atmosphere for a long time. Experiments uh, back in 1859 by Tyndall showed that carbon dioxide traps heat and warms the Earth's surface. Um, we recognized for, for many decades that this was sort of the first set of experiments that showed us that carbon dioxide warms the atmosphere. But then interestingly, a few years back in 2011, we actually discovered that a woman, Eunice Foote, did experiments that revealed this effect even earlier than Tyndall's experiments back in 1856. So discovering this piece of history and recognizing that a woman scientist had actually discovered this, um, this trend in these patterns before Tyndall um, was a result of the, the Google project to dig digitize the archives of the uh, American Academy for the Advancement of Science. And so through that digitization project, uh, we came across Eunice Foote's experiments, uh, which showed that she, she got this right even three years earlier. And so this rising uh, amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is causing global warming. We see this in the temperature patterns. If we look back um, from 1890 through present, this last bar here are the data for 2016. We've had an exceptionally warm year this past year. And so we see a really clear trend in warming. Um, if we look from a global perspective. And so what's causing this warming? I mentioned we're releasing carbon dioxide emissions. Uh, these are from fossil fuels and producing cement, and also from shifting land use change. So the sum of these three processes, fossil fuels plus uh, cement production plus land use change, are what's driving our carbon dioxide emissions to the atmosphere. But if we look at these data, and compare that to the atmospheric growth of carbon dioxide, if we stare at these axes, you'll notice that the atmospheric growth in carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is only about half of emissions. So what, what is happening to this extra carbon dioxide that we're emitting to the atmosphere that isn't staying there? Where is it going? It's going into ecosystems. Ecosystems are taking up 
and uh, capturing and holding on to about 40 to 50 percent of the carbon dioxide that we emit into the atmosphere. And so they're doing an enormous service for us in helping to buffer some of the impacts of global warming that we would otherwise experience. And so oceans are taking up carbon dioxide. We see these um, negative numbers here, I meaning the ecosystems are a sink for carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. And we also see uptake by the terrestrial biosphere, by the land um, ecosystems, as they're also helping to take up carbon dioxide. However, it's enormously uncertain, uncertain um, the extent, the magnitude, and uh, the extent to which ecosystems are going to be able to continue taking up carbon dioxide into the future. Um, we see the atmospheric growth rate of carbon dioxide is outpacing this slow, gradual increase in carbon dioxide uptake by the ocean. And we also see that the terrestrial land sink for carbon dioxide is extremely variable year to year. And so the land sink is becoming more variable for taking up carbon dioxide because of disturbance feedbacks. So we have feedbacks as climate change progresses, we start to see things like drought and fires, um, insect outbreaks, and all of these things disrupt ecosystems and release even more carbon dioxide back to the atmosphere. And so uh, that's really the, the focus in my lab is thinking about these feedbacks between climate and other types of ecosystem disturbances and how that might impact the ecosystem carbon cycle. So here is a cartoon of the ecosystem carbon cycle and how ecosystems are taking up carbon dioxide. So plants, and this is so, so we're seeing here three different pools of carbon in the atmosphere, in plants, and in soils. And so plants are taking up carbon dioxide through photosynthesis. They're transforming that carbon dioxide into more complex carbon molecules, some of which are then deposited to the soil either through leaf fall or a tree falling over or um, roots dying in the soil, carbon's transferred to the soil pool, then microorganisms that live in the soil decompose that carbon and respire some of that carbon back to the atmosphere um, through their metabolisms. So the metabolism of these microorganisms is breaking down this carbon and releasing it back to the atmosphere. Plants are also respiring. Plants respire to um, maintain their tissues, to grow new tissues, um, and some of this carbon dioxide is also released by plants back from the atmosphere. So as the result of these um, processes, the net carbon dioxide flux from ecosystems, as we saw from the previous uh, graphs, has been a sink of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, but these um, arrows might change with future disturbance feedbacks. And so forests are an, inc an incredibly important piece of the global um, carbon cycle. Because they take up so much carbon dioxide, they're extremely productive ecosystems. And so this is a, a pie chart showing all of all the ecosystems in the world, forests are taking up the large majority of the carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. And so uh, to kind of summarize here before we move on, why are forests important for climate change? It's helping to buffer these fossil fuel emissions that we're releasing to the atmosphere. So ecosystems are taking up 40 to 50 percent of the carbon dioxide from fossil fuels. However, forest disturbance feedbacks might disrupt this storage. And one of the things that might disrupt this storage is the interaction between climate change and invasive insects. Um, so here are examples of three different um, invasive insects and pathogens that I've worked on. Um, the hemlock woolly adelgid up here in the, in the upper left, the gypsy moth here in the lower left, and um, the blister rust fungus. Um, I'm showing a, a picture that um, I took in, in the Yellowstone ecosystem here. And uh, I picked these, these three examples because we can really see um, this, this picture was taken in a wilderness area of Yellowstone, so very far from human impact. But blister rust is a fungus that was introduced um, through nursery plantations from different trees. And so this is a fungus that was, was introduced by human activities um, and has spread all the way to our remote wilderness areas of the country now. Um, Hemlock woolly adelgid and gypsy moth um, both impact kind of remote forests and our trees in our backyards. Um, some of you might have had uh, trees that have been damaged by these two insects if you live in, uh, on the East Coast or in the Northeast. 
And so really from the remote wilderness areas of our country all the way to the trees in our backyard, invasive insects have an important role in um, damaging and disrupting uh, the trees. And so these forest insects and pathogens um, have been introduced by various uh, methods where uh, scientists have called this our human transportation network um, and our global connectivity of our economy as the new, they've called it the new Pangea. And so this is a, a, a diagram showing um, this moment of Pangea in Earth's geologic history when all of the continents were connected to each other and organisms moved across the continents. And we can see this is a, a, a diagram showing our shipping routes, all of our air and sea and land shipping routes, and how these shipping routes really have created, created this connected globe again. And so as we're moving things from one place to another around the world, uh, these forests, insects, and pathogens, which I call uh, FIPS for short, are along for the ride. They're being moved along with all these things as we um, move things for trade. And so uh, forest insects and pathogens are important. They have a larger ecological impact on forests than all other disturbances combined. And if you're uh, not moved by, by that fact, they also have an enormous economic impact on um, local governments, um, which spend $2 billion a year trying to control insect outbreaks, um, private losses of private property values, um, homeowner, or, excuse me, homeowner expenses, as you have to pay for someone to cut down the dead trees in your yard after these things move through, and also federal expenses and expenses for timber companies. So they're incredibly important from an economic perspective as well. However, due to this, um, even, even though um, FIPS are enormously important in thinking about feedbacks with uh, climate change and feedbacks that we care about um, with the trees in our backyard, they're not currently represented in um, models that, that model climate change and the carbon cycle. Because of the huge biodiversity of these different types of FIPS, there are hundreds of different types of insects and pathogens that we could potentially think of as important for including in these carbon models. And so, first of all, when we're talking about a model, and this is uh, um, summarizing some of the things that we talk about in my course, Biological Modeling, um, let's just start by thinking, what is a model? So when we make a model, we're thinking about some abstraction of reality that can be useful to us for examining system processes. And so this diagram right here, where we have, uh, this is a, a poorly drawn cartoon tree. <laughs> Uh, with a leaf pole up here, a stem, and some roots, and then arrows that are showing the movement of carbon and water through a tree. This representation is a model. When we draw this type of diagram, we're drawing a model. And then we want to use that model uh, within this context. Uh, we write that all of those different arrows in math. And then we program all of that math into a computer to understand how all of these processes interact with each other. And so we start with our abstraction here of our cartoon tree and the carbon and water pathways. We turn that into math equations um, that represent those arrows, then into computer code. And then we use that computer code to generate output and scenarios to um, do experiments that we could never do in the real world, like simulate total mortality from all the trees on the planet, or simulate changes in response to severe climate change that we would hope to never experience. Um, and so models allow us to explore scenarios for the future um, without having to live them in reality and collect data on them in reality. And so this is uh, what we do in, in my course, Biological Modeling. We think about how to get from these different processes um, models that can generate these output and scenarios for a range of different biological processes from, from the cell to global ecosystems. And so with these modeling studies, um, you often want to start with the simplest model possible. And so um, previous modeling studies have started with the simplest model possible where they said, okay, we want to model the impacts of FIPS. And so let's assume that FIPS caused instant tree mortality and then see what happens in the models. So uh, we get the invasion of some insect, and then the trees instantly die. And we're thinking about these trade-offs between model complexity and model utility, how useful that model is for us. That type of model would be down here. It's a model of low complexity 
but it's not very useful because it doesn't really simulate reality. We know that trees don't instantly die as soon as they are attacked by some insect or pathogen. We know that they experience this range of responses from slight stress all the way to mortality that varies based on the, the attack intensity, the attack length of these different insects and pathogens, and the tree defenses. Trees aren't totally helpless against any insect or pathogen that comes along. Trees can uh, defend themselves and sometimes even eventually recover from these types of disturbances and continue to grow. And so this is uh, just to quickly highlight something that we talk about in Intro to Organismal Biology, how trees mobilize these resources to respond to stress. And so um, this is a, a key thing that we talk about um, in intro biology as well. Okay, so we started out with this, this model that was not real, very realistic, sitting here in low model complexity and low model, model utility. And the goal of uh, the project that we're working on in my lab is to develop a model that is more in the middle here, where we have categories of plant impacts, where we're not assuming instant uh, death in response to um, insects and pathogens. And so in order to develop that type of model, we start with this same uh, model diagram here where we have a tree and these basic flows of carbon and water through the tree. And then we've developed five general categories of FIPS, of insects and pathogens, that can impact these plant pathways. And so in creating these categories, we hope this would be more useful than just saying instant tree death. Uh, but still general enough so they could, it could capture the hundreds of different types of insects and pathogens that operate in our forests. And so we have these five classes, defoliators, loam feeders, xylem disruptors, stem rots, and root rots. And these are connected to these different arrows within our model diagram. So phloem feeders are taking out some of the carbon that's fixed by photosynthesis in the leaves before it's transported to the tree's storage pool. Defoliators are taking out some of these leaves from the trees. So these insects and pathogens are connected to these tree pathways within our new model that we've, we've created. And so two examples of these insects and pathogens are um, the hemlock woolly adelgid, which is a flow and feeder. We can see um, it's kind of uh, gross little insects here um, sitting at the, the base of these, these hemlock needles. And they're attached to these hemlock needles and just sucking out this carbon that the leaves are fixing before it can get to the rest of the tree. And you see on the right here a picture of a gypsy moth that has uh, eaten away these areas of holes within this leaf. So these are two examples of, um, that represent these two classes of, of FIPS within our model. And so when we develop this model, again we want to start with a simple scenario to test how useful it is. And so we started with a uniform age pine forest, so just one species, um, no biodiversity in this forest. And we uh, implemented these different classes of insects and pathogens with different attack intensities. And then we saw what our model um, simulated in response to those different attack intensities in this low biodiversity stand. And so we saw from these initial model experiments that even though this was kind of a slight change to the um, to the, the ecosystem model, we predicted a much wider range of more realistic types of responses with this model structure than assuming that the trees are instantly dying. So we can see um, blue to red is sort of increasing intensity of attack. And if we look at this storage pool here, we see that in a lot of cases, trees might recover from an insect or pathogen attack, even though in some of these red cases, they might eventually die still. And so uh, the next step in our lab is to push um, this simple model from this simple case study in a pine forest out to be able to represent more complex forests. And so there are not many examples of forests that are just entirely one species of tree. And so in order to do that, we're connecting to a more sophisticated model, um, the ecosystem demography model, where this is a, um, a these are diagrams showing actual model output where we're simulating different species within the forest and different size structure of different trees within the forest as well. So this is, we would say, is a more realistic model for representing um, a, an actual forest. And we're connecting this, um, this, this uh, stuff on the right here 
is thinking about how do FIPS impact the forest. So looking at how forest insects and pathogens are changing these arrows within this diagram. And then we're connecting that with a set of models and data to think about where are FIPS in the forest. And so this is using satellite and aerial imagery, um, survey data, and spread models of these insects and pathogens to think about where are they in forests, and then how are they impacting the trees within the forest. And so we're doing this with these um, two example um, FIPS to start out. And these are, are different in their pathway by which they impact trees, phloem feeders versus defoliators, and also in their um, general ecology. Hemlock willy indulgent is species specific. It only attacks hemlock trees. And we compare that to a gypsy moth, which is a generalist. It can eat lots of different types of species. Um, they also vary in the time scale of attack. Hemlock willy indulgent generally causes mortality over five to 10 years. Uh, gypsy moth rarely causes direct mortality. And then also the types of forests that they, that they impact. Hemlock willy indulgent operates in old forests and gypsy moth is um, can can um, accumulate in almost any forest. And so with these two case studies, we're testing hypotheses in ecology. So our first hypothesis is to use this model framework um, to see whether there is some abundance threshold of FIPS that actually might increase tree diversity. So the idea behind this is that some low amount of disturbance in forests is actually important for forest health because it creates opportunities for different tree species to get a foothold. The second hypothesis that we're testing is that the biodiversity in the forest is important for thinking about how a forest recovers to an insect or pathogen attack. And so within this hypothesis, we're thinking about does high diversity um, lead to high resilience within a forest after it's attacked? Um, and conversely, does low diversity, this is a picture of a pine barren, um, does low diversity lead to low resilience in a, in a forest? And lastly, we're thinking about these feedbacks between climate change and um, insect stress within trees. And this is really connected to ideas that we um, develop within ecosystem ecology. And so uh, for this example, I'll talk about a specific case study with the gypsy moth, uh, where the gypsy moth under conditions of normal rainfall is actually controlled by a fungal pathogen. So there is a fungal pathogen that's specific to gypsy moth that thrives in wet normal rainfall conditions because fungi require um, spores and wet conditions to, to um, reproduce. And so under conditions of normal rainfall, the gypsy moth is controlled by this pathogen, which leads to small populations of the gypsy moth. However, if any of you have been in the Northeast this year, you know that we did not experience normal rainfall conditions. There was a severe drought in the Northeast that's still going on right now. Um, we can see from this, this drought map here. And in conditions of drought, the populations of this fungal pathogen can't uh, become large enough to actually control the gypsy moth populations, and this triggers an outbreak of gypsy moth. And so uh, these trees that are um, experiencing this outbreak from the gypsy moth because it can't be controlled by its fungal pathogen are also experiencing drought, experiencing drought stress during a drought. And so this type of impact can even have a larger impact overall on the tree under climate change and gypsy moth stress than it might experience from just one of those things or the other. And so um, this is just a, an aerial photograph here that was taken from an airplane, um, an area in Exeter, Rhode Island from June 2016, um, where 2016 was the driest year in a very long time in New England. And we've also experienced the largest gypsy moth outbreak in decades. And so we can see all of these trees are completely defoliated. So their leaves have been totally removed by the gypsy moth um, in just huge areas of New England this year. And so this might also have feedbacks with climate change. If areas of the forest are being defoliated, if their leaves are removed, this leads to more sunlight reaching the forest floor. If more sunlight is reaching the forest floor, temperatures go up, we have even more evaporation of water from soils, and the trees might experience even more severe drought stress if more of that water is evaporating. Um, so these are the types of feedbacks that we think about um, within my research and within um, the ecosystem ecology class to think about how ecosystems are responding to these different types of stress. 
And so uh, we're doing this research in um, forests across New England and across the country. We're also doing it on campus right here. Uh, there's a hemlock grove on the other side. This is Lake Waban right here. These are the athletic fields of Wellesley right here. And there is a large hemlock grove right in here where we are measuring trees uh, that currently have hemlock bully adelgid infestation. And our goal in this project is to think about what will the future of this ecosystem look like as the hemlock bully adelgid progresses and continues to stress these trees. And so we're collecting baseline data right now on tree size, tree density, age, um, soil structure, soil chemistry, and biodiversity to try to understand how this ecosystem might change as the hemlock wood adelgid um, continues to create stress within this area of campus. And this project is connected with the Paulson Initiative for the Ecology of Place, which is um, really geared towards thinking about whether we can use adaptive management, uh, so management of our forests that's informed by scientific study, um, to be responsible stewards of our ecosystems. And so one of the things I, I struggle a little bit with in teaching these types of topics and in working with my students in the lab is this can be incredibly depressing <laughs> to work on these topics of climate change and these like doom uh, images of thinking about forest collapse. And so one of, one of the things that I really like about this project um, is that we're, we're forced to think about, okay, well, if these trees are stressed, if they're going to die from the hemlock oil adelgid, then what trees might we plant in their place? How might, might we manage our ecosystems to still have some of the things that we value about forests, even if some of these species are disappearing? And I think this is really a challenge um, to, to our students for thinking about these future conditions when we have all these different types of stress that are happening at the same time. Um, help to give them some, uh, some hope for the future in thinking about how might we manage these ecosystems into the future, um, even if some species are, are disappearing. And so uh, just quickly here uh, to, to summarize, um, so in, in my research, in my teaching, we think about how, how will forests change? And so the first step of this process is to ask meaningful questions that can be tested by hypotheses. And this is really getting at thinking about the scientific method. How, do we, how can I help students to appreciate the scientific method and employ techniques from the scientific method to answer their questions that they develop? Secondly, we work on developing complex and accurate representations of ecosystems and models. And this is really developing computational um, skills within students and, and within myself too. I'm constantly learning new things about how can we um, use the cutting edge technology of computers to help us understand what's going to happen to ecosystems in the future. We also synthesize existing data sets and models. That's really working on statistical analysis. How do we work with big data sets to understand um, patterns across many different types of forests? We're also collecting new data from emerging processes in the field. This is thinking about experimental design. How can we design experiments to test the hypotheses that we're interested in? And lastly, um, just in general being informed citizens of our world and helping other people to understand these processes that are happening within forests as well. And I would say this is really doing ethical science, thinking about how can we do the best science possible and then how can we communicate that to other people. And Wellesley is a place that is particularly well suited to um, train students and to develop students that can think across these different um, categories of, of spatial skills and also uh, disciplinary skills. So this is um, a beautiful place to work on these types of problems because environmental problems aren't just science problems. <laughs> they're problems of ethics, they're problems of history, they're problems of economics and sociology and politics. And they touch all of these other disciplines uh, where I think Wellesley is a particularly exciting place to work on these issues because students are taking classes in these other, from these other perspectives and they're learning to think in different ways about uh, these types of issues. And hopefully that type of framework can help us better understand how to bridge these scales of local knowledge um, to global solutions. And so with that, um, thank you very much for all being here this morning. I want to briefly acknowledge um, our funding sources from, um, from NSF and from the Exceed um, Supercomputing Center. And um, I particularly want to acknowledge my um, the, the undergraduate students that I collaborate with at the Ecolab, um, Marita Chen, Emma Conrad Rooney, Caroline Harper, Prapti Karala, and Sarah Russell.
And uh, I encourage you to email me with any questions if, if you think of them later. Um, email me to ask about any of the classes that I've talked about. Um, and because this is Friends and Family Weekend, I also want to take a moment to thank my parents, who happen to be visiting this weekend and are also in the audience, uh, for all of their support over the years. And uh, just to acknowledge my family at home as well, my husband and my son Henry, who uh, is a motivating force for me in thinking about a lot of these topics and thinking about uh, the type of world that we're creating that he and future generations are going to inherit. And so uh, I'll end there and I'm happy to take any questions about uh, any of the research aspects, teaching aspects, uh, whatever, uh, at this moment. And thank you. Thank you all for being here this morning. Yes? Yeah, um, it seems to me that as I I look at forest cover trends across uh, time, that actually our forest cover in the United States has, has been increasing over the last several decades, and although individual species types change, for example, the chestnut blight in the 20s wiped out the forest of Kentucky and West Virginia and Appalachia. You, know, you drive to Kentucky and West Virginia and Appalachia now, and it's, uh, maple, hemp, um, uh, oak dominated system with poplars and that, and so that change of tree type mm -hmm. may have you know, changed the ecosystem, but as an overall cover and therefore a carbon sink, right. that change may have actually, the new growth may have actually increased carbon Right, and, it's, and in fact it has. We see that the, um, the forests of the Northeast have been a tremendous sink for carbon dioxide compared to other global ecosystems within the past uh, um, century or so, mostly with farm abandonment. And so uh, with the movement of farms from, from the Northeast to uh, other parts of, of the US and to other areas abroad, uh, with farm abandonment in the Northeast, we have seen a tremendous regrowth of forests over the past 100, 150 years or so. Um, but, but to get at the question, um, sorry, let me, let me move back here. Uh, to get at that question um, that really connects to this type of hypothesis that we're trying to look at within um, within our modeling framework because the types of forests that um, you described where chestnut blight has wiped out all of the, the mature chestnut trees from our forests, but that mostly happened within high diversity forests. So other species were able to kind of take over and compensate for that loss of the chestnut. We might have seen some other types of um, ecosystem shifts, for example, in um, small mammal populations maybe with the loss of, of chestnuts, but overall we don't see a big impact on the carbon cycle. So that's one of the things we're trying to get at with comparing um, different levels of diversity in the forest um, and thinking about what happens if there just aren't enough species to kind of shift in and take the place of species that are, that are being stressed. Um, so yeah, that's, that's an excellent question. Absolutely. Everyone ready for your final exam now? <laughs> All right, well, thank you. Oh, sorry, sorry, go ahead. I was going to say, as an individual holder, trees in your yard, when you see these insects, there's a lot of adult. Adult, yeah. Yeah, no, it's, it's incredibly complex to think about what to do, and it, it really, um, if we're thinking about management uh, of, of, of individual trees, uh, it's sort of on a case-by-case -case basis with different types of insects and pathogens, because some of them are, um, trees can be more resilient to them than others. Uh, the hemlock woolly adelgid is, is an example where it is, um, its effects are usually extreme. It, it, causes, I think, if I remember right, something like 99% mortality in trees with it in habits. And so um, that might be a case where you sort of have to weigh um, how, much, how much effort do I want to spend fighting this insect that is in all of these other places in the Northeast as well. And even if, 
even if we, we kind of managed to eradicate it from our trees in, in one yard, they, they might just move from the trees in the next yard in the next year. Um, and so that becomes a, a case that is um, yeah, really, really difficult to decide what to do. But there are, um, I should mention, major research efforts with respect to many of these insects and pathogens to better understand um, genetic resi resilience within particular subsets of species. Um, and so there are very big programs to try to um, identify genes that are connected to resilience of, um, of trees to, to insect and pathogen attack, and then to uh, develop breeding programs to uh, generate trees that are resilient to these types of things so that we can plant and replace um, species with, with those um, resilient species. So, exactly, yeah, yeah, elms. Um, another example is the um, a lot of the white pines in the southwest um, are vulnerable to, to that blister rust fungus that I showed earlier. And there's a big program um, to kind of explore why this one to two percent of individuals are, are totally resistant to the fungus. And so, yeah, that is a, a, another avenue for hope, I guess. It's not with us. Yeah? Yeah, I was wondering how long you run these simulations. Uh, obviously, it takes enormous amounts of data. So, how long does it take? Or you have to do them by small geographic areas yeah. to do it. And, and, and then I guess the other thing is how about the feedback? How do you measure how good your how accurate your your simulations are? Exactly, yeah, that's a great question. So to answer um, your, your first part that you asked about, um, when we do so within this project, we're working at a um, our, our largest scale that we're focusing on is the continuous U.S., so from the, the whole, from California all the way through to the Northeast, and when we do those simulations, we're working on an eight-kilometer grid, so that's a very fine resolution if we're thinking about um, the, the coverage for, for the entire country, and so that's why we work with the, um, the supercomputing center where all of this um, computing is actually done in the cloud with computers that are in databanks, yeah, exactly, and so when we do those types of simulations, we can block off different regions and send sort of different regions to different supercomputers and then have them bring back and uh, re-aggregate and interpret the results that way. So it's really this um, hugely exponential growth in computing power has made possible a lot of the um, really new cutting edge research um, in this field to, to better understand um, these simulations at finer spatial scales. Um, and then I forgot the second part of your question, sorry. Uh, well, I was talking about how long it takes, but you have the um, feedback. How, do you, how are you going to measure how accurate your simulations are and can you continue to optimize them? Right, so um, a couple of different methods. One of the things we do is when we are um, kind of optimizing our models to be realistic, we hold back some of the data during that process and we save it for validation later on. So that's one way you kind of separate out and save some of the data for um, optimizing the model and then save some of it to be able to validate it later on so that those are different data sources because if we were optimizing a model with data and then comparing it to the same data, we would be right. falsely accurate. <laughs> Um, so that's one method that we use. And then another thing that we um, have been working with collaborators um, at, at Boston University on is um, a lot of these questions that we're thinking about have data sets that are continually being updated. Researchers are going out every year and collecting new data um, because people are very interested in learning about all these different processes. And so we can use our model simulations for one year, and then the next year when new data are collected, we have a good test, a uh, good independent test of whether or not our, our model um, is holding up to the data. Um, so that's another, another thing that we use. Yeah. You mentioned how depressing this is. Um, and I noticed you have a small child. Um, this may go way beyond the scope of your talk, but I wonder since you have a group of people here, uh, if you want to say what you think we can do to uh, reduce fun change or stimulus attack, and also, yeah, just like... Yeah, that's... That's the million dollar question. <laughs> and I think um, the, the, the root of climate change is the carbon dioxide emissions. 
And so um, part of the complexity in climate change is that those carbon dioxide emissions are wrapped up in so many different pieces of our economy, of our everyday lives, of our food, um, that it's really hard to, there's not a silver bullet for thinking about how we're going to um, reduce those carbon dioxide emissions. I really do think it's going to be an approach that requires multiple efforts to shift to less carbon intensive fuel sources, um, develop new technologies for getting the energy we need to power our economy that aren't so um, uh, carbon intensive. Um, also, I think there's, there's a lot of opportunity for reduction and more efficiency in the, in the ways that we do use carbon dioxide now um, for all of these different, different methods. Um, agriculture is something that's incredibly important for um, feeding the world, and yet it's also um, the source of many of these greenhouse gas emissions. And so kind of balancing and, and developing new agricultural technologies and techniques that can help us to, to feed everyone and yet be uh, less carbon intensive is also a kind of major opportunity for, for research and uh, yeah, development. So, so yeah, I think there is there's no one, one best answer, but um, I think that focusing on multiple efforts, uh, nothing can hurt at this point. <laughs> Uh, yeah. Yep. You mentioned that your focus was on North America. Yep. Are you working with people from other places? Yeah, absolutely. So one of the um, big selling points that got us funding in order to do this work is we're building it in a way that's generalizable to anywhere, any other ecosystem in the world. And so when we're developing our model structures for how we put these things together, um, I've already been in touch with colleagues who work on models for tropical forests, and they're thinking about how these types of things can connect to tropical forests or um, other temperate forests in other places. Um, and so when we were designing this project from the beginning, we were thinking about how can this tool be useful for us, and how can it be most useful to everyone else who, who is investigating these types of questions. And I would say that is a... Um, a major selling point for the National Science Foundation now uh, because they don't want you to do these one-off projects where you got your results in this one one scenario but you can't extend it to anything else and so um, that definitely helps in, in that regard to, to think about that from the beginning. Yeah. How much is the, the, the boreal forest, how fast, what's happening? Yeah, so the boreal forests are experiencing um, a couple of different types of feedback with um, feedbacks with climate change. So there, they're experiencing um, drought in a lot of areas of the boreal forest, um, but then, which the, the drought causes tree, tree stress and occasionally um, more fires in the boreal forest. Um, but the boreal forest is actually relatively well adapted to fire. Um, and so that's an example where we're seeing um, kind of more drought and more fires. Also melting permafrost in the boreal forest is, is a major issue. Um, and so as that permanently frozen soil starts to thaw out, it releases carbon dioxide as the soil is decomposing. And it also releases methane um, because waterlogged soils can become anaerobic. And so um, the archaea that live within um, anaerobic soils can produce methane, which is an even more powerful gas than carbon dioxide. And so um, that's another kind of type of feedback that happens there. And um, with respect to insects, um, they've seen uh, occasional outbreaks of the spruce beetle in um, areas of Alaska, for example. And so um, those have had a really severe and quick impact on the forest because they tend to be more low diversity forests than the, the forests that we have here in the, in the Northeast. So there are kind of a set of different complicated feedbacks that, that happen in boreal forests as well, uh, but are connected to, to many of the things that we also see in temperate forests. And yeah, I was noticing you were talking about Because I, 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 I read a book, an interesting book, uh, called 1491, which 
Yeah, absolutely. There is um, really a tremendous and even growing amount of evidence that shows the really long-term effect that we've had um, on the planet. And even sometimes the subtle ways that we shift ecosystems, if we're thinking about um, particular species or, or changing um, disturbance regimes, for example, people that have lived in um, lived in the Northeast before the um, settlement from, from uh, European settlers to Americas were, were burning parts of the forest to create meadows, to have deer. Um, and so there really are a, a really huge number of examples, and we do talk about that um, in my class. Even uh, if you, there, there are studies that have looked back at the, um, in, in, he, in the human evolution, the expansion um, of humans out of Africa, you can trace in the, um, in ice deposits, changes in the carbon dioxide levels as they started farming new areas of the world. Um, so there really is a, a kind of interesting and unique um, sets, of, sets of data that can give us um, insights into, into those types of processes. And um, I love type, talking about those types of things because I also love history. <laughs> so it's a, it's a fun opportunity to kind of think about um, this really long-term impact that we've had uh, on the planet. Both your pictures up there are both uh, man-managed systems. Exactly, yep, absolutely. I would argue that there are very few systems that aren't this these days, if we, uh, especially if we think about climate change as a type of management um, that's happening everywhere. Any other questions? Well, thank you so much, and I hope everyone enjoys the beautiful day outside today. <laughs>